Hi, good morning. Welcome back to CS372. Today we start the last segment of the course, and we plan to cover consciousness for the next six lectures. And why do we get into consciousness? Because the several scholars agree the current AI hits again some limitations. And the major reason is because the current AI only models human unconsciousness. So we have to be able to understand consciousness thoroughly and then we perhaps can model consciousness and try to study consciousness involving multiple disciplines, including psychiatry, biology, neuroscience, physics, and so on and so forth. And today we start our first lecture and Dr. Vakas Duvari will present the topic of AI in psychiatry. And Dr. Duvari enjoys distinguished academia records including his B.S. degree in biology and chemistry from Caltech, and Ph.D. in psychiatry from Stanford University, and finally M.D. from UC San Diego. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Duvari. So in the initial side, in a title, you've seen this phrase, brainless and mindless. And I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to that. Um, this is a quote from a New York Times Magazine article um, where one psychiatrist is quoting another psychiatrist. Uh, and the psychiatrist being quoted is Leon Eisenberg. So that's what this quote refers to. So the quote is that in the first half of the 20th century, American psychiatry is virtually, quote unquote, brainless. And the second half, half of the 20th century psychiatry became virtually mindless. So uh, hence, my uh, hope is that uh, with advances and maybe particularly technology, uh, we're able to go past both mindless and brainless. Specifically, the reason these terms were used here is because historically, uh, psychiatry had a lot of um, uh, reliance on psychoanalysis, some of the earlier ways of treating patients. And so that's what is being referred to by uh, Leon Eisenberg as brainless. And then mindless refers to this uh, shift to using medication to treat to the exclusion of everything else. Um, and the point he's really making is that it really should be a combination. I mean, at the end of the day, it should be a holistic approach. Um, so Taking a step back before we kind of get into what we want to do, I like this quote because ultimately um, we should know what we're solving for. So this is a quote from Steve Jobs. So if you define the problem correctly, you almost always have the solution. So what is the problem? So hopefully the next few slides will start to define that. So um, to begin with, um, if you look at the overall burden in terms of uh, diseases and their impact, you'll find that about fifth down is mental health and substance use disorders. So pretty large impact. Um, so uh, really making the point that uh, not is it only suffering, although that should be plenty of a reason, uh, there's also uh, an equivalent of a um, uh, lifetime impact and uh, impact in terms of disability and other measures will show you money as well. When it comes to money, this is a, an older quote. This is from about you know seven-ish years ago, um, seven, eight years ago. So 186 billion was spent on healthcare services to treat mental health disorders. Um, and we're talking about the US. So 44.7 million or 18, almost 20% of US adults, 18 or older, reported any kind of mental illness, and that's in 2016. And then again, close to about 10% of adults um, visited a provider in, in the prior uh, year in 2015. Again, speaking to impact. Why is all of that important? Well, one important reason is um, suicides. Uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of uh, problems with mental health, and particularly that there's a worrisome trend in suicides. Now, if you look at um, the graph here, the solid line, uh, where hopefully you see my pointer, 
uh, is the average. So that's the average across the US and it's average over time going up. So there uh, up to about 2015 in this graph. And the interesting thing that this shows is that if you look at the top half of the graph um, and you would ask, okay, let's divide it between rural and not rural and there are details about what that is. Uh, which one do you think would have a higher rate? Um, you know, in the past, there've been all these um, um, ideas about how more urban aspects have a negative impact on um, well-being of people. And so what this in fact shows you is that the top half of the graph is all less than urban. So small metro, micropolitan so-called, uh, and then presumably rural, uh, non-metro. Uh, all of those are higher. And one source as to why could be this graph. Um, this, this depiction. So on the left side, you have the suicide rates that we were talking about, except in this case, the color codes for the number per 100,000 um, over a similar period that we talked about and across the country. So deeper blue is a problem. And then now if you overlay that, um, uh, you'll see at least one thing, but maybe two. One is that it also starts to correlate with a deeper color on the right graph. And the deeper color on the right graph speaks to um, basically a negative um, uh, sort of availability as in a deficit of psychiatrists relative to what we'd like. So the, the white colored boxes are presumably kind of the middle of the road and um, things going down deeper in this color scheme towards the reddish pinkish. Um, are a deficit. So the deficit starts to overlap with where the problems are. And so maybe that's telling us something. Um, the other thing is that we're also looking at rural areas, um, much like what we saw in the graph before. So if you're not enough providers, maybe that's part of the problem now uh, and, and where they are in terms of networks uh, of resources. This graph tells you a little more as you try to understand the problem and say, okay, well, who's at higher risk, who's not? Um, this is males and females. And so male patients, as you can tell, the numbers are higher on the right side, just to give you a, uh, a trend here um, and also across age groups. So higher across the board. Um, so potentially something uh, biological, potentially something also social in terms of roles involved. Now, if we look at, continue to look at the impact um, of mental health um, in, in a social context and how that's evolved, very recent um, trend has been that uh, the pandemic really changed uh, how virtual care is viewed. And so one might think, okay, well, um, virtual care means you can reach people. Uh, you don't have to be bound by physically, geographically where you are. That should be a good thing. Um, and well, um, that's potential has certainly been seen. There's lots of money that's been raised um, starting in 2019 um, and that continued through 2020, 2021. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see how that continues into the future. But with all this uh, money being poured in and opportunity for seeing therapists, um, What's also been noticed is that there's been a big uptick, 30% increase in the, um, uh, sorry, 60% increase in users uh, in this one particular instance of an app called Talkspace, which again makes access very easy. And um, the 60% of his users are in therapy for the first time. So again, speaking to this idea that maybe, maybe with virtual care becoming more widespread, um, and more um, easily um, accessible uh, across the US, despite all those graphs and um, pictures I showed you, maybe that'll have an impact. Um, so as we're defining the problem, um, and we kind of, this is much more current as of this month, um, one of the companies that was part of this group of the many companies that um, were heavily invested in to provide mental health services, um, had a bit of a setback. 
uh, where uh, there was a lot of concern about how prescribing was happening. And in this instance, um, the headline is referring to how Adderall, which was being prescribed, uh, was now being halted. And there's uh, a lot more news about this. So again, kind of maybe following the pendulum, maybe it got too easy, whatever that means. Um, one thing to note in this context, especially with uh, Adderall, which is a controlled substance, is that um, it was not something you could do earlier. You, 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 you couldn't um, prescribe Adderall uh, essentially over the internet uh, before we were in this emergency authorization period, which we're in now. Um, so one of the questions is, um, by making virtual care easier to get to, by removing barriers, um, are we only doing good or are we also doing some harm? Um, and, and why is that harm happening if it's happening? What is a better way to do it? So again, starting to define the problem. Um, what is access the issue? And uh, with access uh, starting to be addressed, is that going to be enough? So we've talked about kind of the, the need side of the equation. Um, you know, it's, I think, important to start to understand a little bit about what we talk about when we talk about depression or anxiety or some of these other disorders. And so we'll go through a few snapshots um, of these uh, disorders. So depression, of course, um, specifically major depression, which is a clinical diagnosis, one of the most common mental disorders in the U.S., um, and it can really impair your ability to function in life um, and obviously have very serious outcomes, um, bad ones like we just uh, looked at in the graph. There's a manual that um, basically provides the diagnostic criteria in psychiatry, and that's called the DSM-5. So that's what you're seeing abbreviated here. And so this is one example of a summary of what clinical depression or major depressive disorder looks like. So period of at least two weeks, uh, where a person experiences loss of interest, low mood, um, and a few other symptoms that go along for the ride. And if you look at the next slide, and we're only talking about depression here, um, in a recent survey, this is from 2017, um, from one of the federal agencies, what you see is that if you were to use this whole um, donut here to represent um, folks coming in or needing depression care, you find that about one third, 35% have no care when it comes to adults. So this is adults on the left side. And then on the right side, 60%, double that, so almost two thirds of adolescents, no treatment at all. Um, and then you have pieces of the other aspect. So on the left side, the adults have a combination of seeing mental health professional and um, having access to medication, some do medication only on the left side. And then similarly, um, there are smaller proportions of medication only um, on the right side. And mental health, proportion, mental health professional visits along with medication. Now the significance of the dark blue is that um, for really most of the conditions that are studied in mental health treatment, um, it's important that um, the treatment involve both a way to think about your illness, how to cope with your illness, learn skills to manage your symptoms, to escalate when needed, in addition to taking medication. So it's really that combination that is seen to be the best option. Um, and yet, the, the data here tells you that um, there are a lot of people who are outside the quote unquote best option uh, among both adults and adolescents. So again, further defining the problem. Now, that little quote up there uh, with the DSM-5 might have given you the idea that, you know, depression is one thing. Well, turns out depression is not one thing. Depression is uh, many things. And what I mean by that is there are many versions. So uh, this is just to give you an example, not to go really into uh, depth on any of these topics, um, but an example of one variety of depression here, if you see my pointer, is psychotic depression. So this is where depression gets so bad that um, it starts to create a break from reality. So where the person cannot separate reality 
from the um, uh, delusional uh, aspects of their thinking that are starting to emerge. And that influences their behavior, influences their thoughts, of course. Um, and then uh, we talked about major depressive disorder. Uh, postpartum is another case. You often hear about it when there are bad outcomes here. Um, you know, it could be somebody who's given birth and something bad happens to the to the baby because um, basically uh, the the mother who's delivered has severe depression, and if untreated, unrecognized, unmanaged, that can have pretty bad effects um, for the mom as well as for the baby. Uh, and in some cases, it can result in the death of the child. So um, uh, in, in that case, uh, death of the neonate, so newborn um, baby. And then there's other patterns. Um, one um, sort of different direction is that so far when we talk about depression, most people refer to one direction of dysfunction, meaning that your mood goes down. Uh, if, if there's a baseline, it drops. Um, and it drops persistently. Bipolar is an example where uh, it can go both ways. So you can have an unreasonable um, amount of uh, excitement, joy, uh, and essentially what ends up becoming a really big problem in terms of risk assessment, uh, because uh, your extreme sort of uh, so-called mania can impair your cognitive decision-making. So as you can tell, just like having a low mood and seeing everything through a dark lens can obviously have a negative impact on your life, uh, so can an unreasonably positive uh, switch of that. And there's some other characteristics as well. So again, starting to give you a sense of there are different kinds of things out there when we talk about depression, different flavors, each with their own course. And so when we start to think about what is the problem we're treating, what are the consequences of this problem, we also need to recognize that uh, we're going to have to somehow uh, deal with this issue that there are um, uh, other variables than basically saying it's is a it depression or is it not depression. Well, Dr. Duvaris, can I uh, ask a yeah, question? Sure. Sure. So this month is, is called uh, Mental Health Awareness yeah. Month, right, in May. Yes. And I, I saw some statistics seems to show uh, about 2020, end of 2020 or end of 20, 2019, the percentage of uh, U.S. adults suffering from depression is about 19.8 percent. So that's much higher than your yeah. 10 percent. And because yes. of pandemic and the, the the ratio further increases, so yeah. so this is really a major crisis. And uh, for teenagers, uh, folks in high school and uh, maybe college because of academia uh, pressure, uh, job pressure, and many other pressures. And uh, it seems like the ratio is even higher. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, I, I think the pandemics really had a pretty bad impact um, when it comes to uh, mental health in general, uh, and then various you know, problems within depression being one of them. Um, yeah, so I think as, to your point, as bad as some of these problems are that we're looking at here, and as bad as the numbers look like, they're actually underestimating uh, the current situation. And that's unfortunate, uh, because uh, it's not like uh, you, you needed more emphasis. It was already pretty bad. So yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I, I think I touched on it a little bit at some point. Um, but um, the, the impact of COVID uh, has definitely been uh, multifaceted. Uh, to some degree, it's just the impact of having a pandemic take over your life. On the other side, it's also limitation of resources, uh, which now are starting to open up and, and maybe even pretty good in some areas. But um, that was a big issue during the pandemic, certainly in the middle of it. So now you've got this problem of there's more problems and there's fewer ways to address them. So of course, you know, the outcomes are going to be bad. Um, does that does that address the question? Oh yes, yes, yeah. The, yeah. the motivation of me asking this question is, I think the the severity of the problem is even worse than you just presented. Yes, that's true. And, and also the severity of the the, the depression itself means uh, the condition of depression. Because of my my family routinely uh, we have this kind of weekend gathering with our friends, and uh, two three years ago. 
uh, virtually all the kids are very healthy. And uh, sub, I mean, very sadly, in, in recent days, and there are one third of kids suffer from major psychiatric disorders. Oh, no. And uh, they cannot go to school. They are one person even uh, in, in a coma state. So so oh, it's no. not really just getting depression, yeah. but the severity yeah. right, of the symptom. Yeah. It's yeah. just horrible. And it's one, one, out, one out of three means even your family is OK, but uh, your surroundings, your neighbors, I mean, you can encounter people having uh, these kind of problems. And most of uh, adults or parents, they don't really understand depression very well, right? So in the right. beginning, maybe mistreated, uh, consider depression symptoms as something like uh, moral problems, right? Like the, yeah. eating, eating disorder, often uh, parents will say, well, this is a bad choice. You're a bad yeah. choice. But yeah. in fact, it's not a, cho a matter of choice. It's a matter of uh, psychiatric disorder. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And actually, I th those are some great points. I was actually going to say that actually um, eating disorders is one of these aspects that really has shot through the roof during this period. Um, and and exactly to your point, um, it's uh, it it's it's such a common thing in terms of having a cultural and social context for eating that people feel like, well, you know, I think. I can feel like an expert on this uh, as a parent or as a family member. And um, I'm not gonna think twice about what I'm saying or doing about it because you know it's eating. What, what, what's, what's there to think about so deeply? Uh, but unfortunately uh, that can lead to trouble. And, and I, yeah, I see this all the time. I mean, it literally last week, um, a parent basically said exactly that uh, where, you know, oh, we thought this kid and this was a very young kid um, you know, was being picky, kind of picking and choosing, and but otherwise get doing, you know, her thing. We, we didn't think it was a big deal. And then the next thing we know, the heart rate drops and uh, the kid's in trouble, has to be in the hospital. So it was a complete shock for the parents. Um, even though, as you say, you know, there's all these articles, there's all this information out there. But I think, um, you know, what you're also highlighting, this is separate really from at least uh, some of the um, technology initiatives, there's a big challenge in terms of translating what's out there in terms of information to something you can use personally. Because what you can use personally uh, seems to somehow fall under the radar. Uh, and, and it's hard to kind of separate your own experience from sort of quote unquote knowledge that um, you know people have access to. So I think, I think it's a great point. Uh, and maybe in, in the conversation ahead, uh, we'll be able to um, pick up on that uh, and see maybe maybe there is a role for technology there. Um, okay, thank you. So, yeah, of course. Um, uh, great point. So um, we were talking about depression until now. This is anxiety, again, giving you snapshots of some common disorders. Um, so when we talk about an anxiety disorder, as opposed to, hey, I'm anxious about this or that, uh, this is anxiety that doesn't go away. It gets worse over time and it interferes with your ability to do your job, go to school, um, function in society, really. Uh, let's see. And so similar to depression, I want to give you a taste that, again, there are different types. Um, so many people have heard about having a panic attack. So panic disorder, uh, which is where people have these frequent panic attacks, um, is anxiety that's kind of concentrated in a short amount of time, which looks quite different compared to generalized anxiety disorder, which is what people call quote unquote worry warts, right? You worry all the time about everything. You wake up in the morning, you just worry. I mean, everything is just a worry. Um, and then again, that's different compared to phobias, which are, hey, I'm afraid of spiders. It's not just afraid of spiders, it's afraid of spiders to the point where it's actually you know, influencing how you manage your day to day um, and, and causes some pretty extreme uh, reactions. Um, and, and in many cases, it may be things that other people don't find an issue at all. Um, so again, giving you a sense that, um, yes, you know, we start to get a sense of some of these problems like depression, and anxiety, but also start to understand that um, there's gonna be types of those that need to be factored in when you design solutions. Substance use disorders is another category. Um, and uh, it can either uh, come by itself or together with one of the others. 
Um, so this little um, graphic shows you that um, it's a big problem, um, over 7 million as of this count. Uh, this is again from one of the federal agencies. Um, as we were talking about, it can come by itself or separately. So on the left side, you see about 40% um, um, also have other mental health diagnoses. So that's two out of five. And then um, you look at it the other way. Now you look at somebody with things that are not a substance use disorder. So some other mental health diagnosis about one out of five of those has a substance use disorder. So again, pretty, pretty significant overlap given the size of these numbers. And then back to what we were talking about with depression, we had that big problem in terms of people not being in treatment. Um, and so here among adults, this gives you a flavor because if you're trying to solve this problem, you wanna get a sense of, okay, well, why aren't people accessing the solutions? Um, about 40%, the top one here, uh, not ready, not ready to stop using whatever the substance is. 35% um, uh, have no health insurance and could not afford the cost. So maybe this is pointing to this fact that in this subpopulation versus maybe others, uh, there's a concentration of people who are not able to afford treatment. Um, so again, when you have solutions, you wanna be able to address the demographic you're trying to solve it in. And maybe your solution is great if you've got all kinds of resources, but is basically useless if you were in this bucket of 35% um, of the people surveyed here. Um, and then there's other things, you know, like it says might cause neighbors to have negative opinions. So typically that's under the bucket of quote unquote stigma. Um, and people worry, is this gonna affect my job or you know if I use my insurance is it gonna you know are people gonna find out um, who has access to that um, what do I do you know that, that I see that a fair amount where you know it's not clear where where do you actually get treatment uh, what's the first step um, so uh, start again starting to get you a sense of what are the problem points um, and then um, this is an example where um, just like we talked about earlier, there's that percentage of people who um, either have the substance use alone or have it together with a mental health disorder that is not substance use. And so in that so-called co-occurring subset, um, uh, of the people who did not get access to care, what were their reasons? So this is the combo. This is not just substance use, this is combo of substance use and another mental health disorder. Um, Top reason, can't afford the cost. Uh, it's a big problem like we were talking about. So when you start designing solutions, that's, that's a big consideration because now you gotta think about, okay, is my solution actually gonna be useful? You know, I think it's great and I think it works great, but maybe it only works great if you have the resources. Um, and then there are other aspects that have to do with perception, fear of being committed. Oh, what are they gonna do once they find out that I need help? Uh, am I going to be locked up? Am I, you know, what's going to happen next? I, I won't have any control over what happens to my life. And this may be even if they already don't have much control over their lives because of the uh, illness that they're dealing with. Um, and then futility of treatment, uh, you know, which again raises questions about why that is. Um, and then we talked about some of the others. So, as we're trying to summarize the problem, um, you know, again, you, you saw the trends as I, as I mentioned them earlier. Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite a familiar list probably for many of you um, because more and more has been written about this now during the pandemic especially. But um, one thing I would recommend, um, and this is um, somebody, um, uh, that's really taken a, a deep look at this. Um, it's Tom Insull, who used to be the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, um, and more recently has worked with California uh, at the state level and, and in other capacities. He decided um, in this book that just came out to go around and interview people across the mental health system in different forms of the mental health system 
pretending basically to be a journalist, not that he said he was, then most people know who he is in the field, uh, but to take that role and to say, okay, let's ask questions about from a patient journey perspective, uh, what's working, what's not working, uh, and when something's not working, uh, why is it not working? Um, and so this is one review. There have been plenty of other reviews for this book that just came out. Um, so what it does is it gives, the reason I mention it here um, is that um, it gives a bit of flavor to some of these uh, bullet points. So we know there's a problem with access. We saw that even in this talk from the beginning with the, with the graphs and the maps of the US. But what is the problem with access? So one of the points that the book makes is, well, actually, if you look at the ratio of how many therapists are available, it, it's, it's a pretty decent number. There are a lot of therapists in the US. Okay, well then how is there an access problem? And what he points to is that there's a problem in terms of how therapy is delivered. Are, are the evidence-based tools being implemented? Are, are the resources that we know work being implemented in a, in a regular, uniform, effective way. And so that's one problem, right? Is that the access may be there to a person who can help you see you, but it's not done in an evidence-based way. There are system hurdles, which um, you'll see all over the book, basically, um, whether it's you wanna get into a program, get into a hospital, uh, get a certain kind of medication that is recommended for you, there's hurdle after hurdle after hurdle that uh, requires you to be quite dogged, persistent, and in many ways, even super functional. And all this from somebody where, you know, it's a brain disorder that's actually impairing them. So how does that work? How are you supposed to be able to overcome those hurdles to actually get access? Um, and a related issue is treatment decisions. So meaning that again, if a disorder is impacting you and say it's a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, it changes how you perceive reality. You got a real problem because now that person has to decide for themselves that, oh, you know, never mind what my voices are telling me. I have to go get treatment. Um, and the laws and, you know, a lot of the states fit that. They fit this idea that, you know, people should be making their own decisions. They should be doing what's good for them. Some places, um, the mental health and clinical systems can can uh, take, take control of the treatment process for various periods of time uh, in other places, not so much. So there's not a uniformity there. Um, California is a good example. There's not a uniformity across the 50 plus counties in California. So the mental health treatment you get, especially for a severe mental illness like schizophrenia can really be 50 plus versions within one state. So, that's obviously not conducive to anything positive in terms of good outcomes. And then the other point he makes um, is we talk about stigma a lot. That's definitely gets a lot of airtime in, in the public sphere. But what he actually starts to make the point of is that it, you know, st stigma may be underselling it. It's really discrimination. It's just you just have to come out and say it. It's discrimination. If somebody's got a mental health diagnosis, it's flat out a problem. Uh, and unless you're in some very secure position, status, or something else, uh, people are just not willing to risk that. And so that can lead to all the problems you saw earlier as to why people don't seek treatment, or sometimes when they do seek treatment, like when you go to an emergency room, uh, the way you're treated is quite different to if you came in with a heart attack. Uh, in many ways, some of these psychiatric emergencies are like a quote unquote, brain attack. Well, why is that different? Why should that be treated differently? Uh, the fact is uh, these conditions are treated differently. Um, and then as you're sort of starting to get the picture here, a lot of the hurdles here require social support. So whatever form that takes, it could be your family, it could be a broader group, like you heard um, um, from, uh, from Professor Chang here. And so it's, it could, be, um, it could be mitigated by social support, but what should that social support look like? Um, and uh, do people know that they need to implement that, put that into action? One of the issues is um, confidentiality, uh, at least in the context of mental health, 
extends to family. So what that means is um, there are lots of situations where you could have uh, a young adult in a hospital or an adult, uh, older, older person. And if that person, for whatever reason, decides, I don't want anybody else to know, maybe it's because of how the mental disorder is impacting them and they can't think through that. Um, or they feel bad because they're super depressed and they don't really want to talk to anyone, whatever the case. All of those factors end up having this negative impact that if they say, nope, I don't, I don't want anybody else to know. Um, even if they're worrying out there, not knowing what happened to you know, their family, their loved one, that's okay. That's, that's how the current law is written. Um, so, so yes, we talk about social support, but in fact, the, the way the system's set up uh, is terrible to actually facilitate or even allow it. And then um, this is something that's touched on here, but um, is probably um, addressed um, even better elsewhere, which is uh, diagnoses we refer to in DSM-5 that I alluded to, uh, the diagnoses in psychiatry, they're really syndromes, they're a collection of symptoms that we put together that hang together. And as they come together uh, and present as one thing or some, one combination of things, uh, it's easy to forget that they're actually a collection of things. Uh, it's, not, it's not one thing as in, oh, you know, um, there's this deficiency of this protein or uh, um, a signaling molecule like insulin, and then therefore you get the downstream effect. It's, it's, it's many things coming together to create the scenario that we see. So um, a lot more needs to be done, obviously, to understand that aspect. And, and there have been a lot of advances. One book I think um, you'll probably get some exposure to here um, is a book called Projections, which was written by a neuroscientist, psychiatrist, um, friend of mine from back in training who's, who's on the faculty at Stanford. Uh, and he, he really wrote this amazing book. Um, and, and I say amazing, not just because of the science, it's a very beautifully written book uh, in, in terms of the writing style. Um, and so, um, so in that particular book uh, written by Carl Dyserat, so Carl really talks about um, how you can start to conceptualize um, to some extent the presentation of the mental health disorders, but also the science behind it. You know, how do you tease it apart? How do you start to understand uh, the neurons, the neuronal circuits that may be driving um, some of those aspects and, and what does the future look like? So again, lots of interesting stuff there, but that, that's probably the last part uh, with diagnoses and syndromes is probably best served um, through, a, through a different source. Yes, yes, Dr. Dr. Duvari, I, I actually just finished reading the book, Projections. It's, oh, great. it's a remarkable, remarkably written book uh, uh, for the, the troubles or the problems or challenges you just mentioned. Right. I, I think uh, I, I talk to many uh, young kids. The first one is uh, often people do not want to reveal they have problems or they don't yeah. think they have problems. Right. Especially like eating disorder. If you yeah. send a kid to the hospital, they are going to be evasive. They are not, not going to say, yes, I have eating disorder, right? right? right. So it's really hard to detect. And, and number two is like you mentioned uh, reputation. You don't want people to know. And yeah. the law actually saying if you are above 18, the, the, your parents cannot make a choice for you. So we right. do see parents, they want to really want to, they are totally stressed out. They want to see right. send their kids to instit institutions but their, their kids refuse to go to institutions though, so they kind of stuck in the middle, right? But yeah. finally, come back to Carl's uh, book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the amazing thing is this uh, uh, optogenetic, right? Mm -hmm. Optogenetic technique. And uh, because so far for mental disorders, uh, we can only see kind of symptoms. We cannot mm -hmm. use instruments to detect. Uh, different mm -hmm. from other diseases, like you can do blood work, you can do yeah. uh, x-ray, but for mental disorders, there's no scientific tools. You can say, oh, your uh, serotonin is too low or your dop right. dopamine, whatever level is too low. So therefore you have this and that, or it's really subjective sometimes. Yeah, so, so I'm really uh, exciting about this uh, technology of 
uh, optogenetics. Hopefully, eventually, will be uh, in, in this uh, treatment process. Yeah, treatment process, and even at this point, you know, as we understand more about how some of the symptoms come about, um, to your point, um, because the symptoms seem so commonplace, uh, you know, yeah, I have days where I'm depressed or I'm anxious or something else um, or tired. Um, well, what, what's to say I'm not trying hard enough? I mean, you alluded to some of this before, you know, it, it becomes sort of the social construct. So um, once we start to understand that um, at the level of what's happening in the brain, um, as, as optogenetics is certainly one powerful way to do, um, my hope is that that can help drive uh, people starting to feel like, you know what, I'm not making this up. When somebody says I should just deal with it, uh, that's not okay. Uh, you know, I might mean, know that's not okay, but uh, now this gives me something to hang on to, to say, okay, I, I, can, I can grab this, this fact here uh, that has been established somehow, and that gives me the confidence and validates my experience, uh, which is, I think, a major problem in a lot of what we see in mental health. Um, and, and maybe that will also drive some of the solutions you're talking about, such as maybe um, allow better communication between parents and kids and, you know, provide kind of that context, as opposed to sort of everything getting more hidden because of stigma and shame, mm -hmm. uh, at least in that context. So kind of, you know, in sync with that, um, the, ho the hope is that apps maybe can help, technology can help, you know, AI can help. And um, some people simplistically say, well, you know, when we do some comparisons, people are more willing to share on uh, technology platforms mm -hmm. than they are in person to person. Um, um, again, these are, you know, small assessments, small studies, maybe even anecdotes, um, but time will tell. Um, the, the other big thing is of course, accessibility. So um, as opposed to having to make appointments, et cetera, there is a way to collect information that is time and location agnostic, potentially can be highly personalized. We're certainly able to do that in the commercial world where things are getting super personalized to be able to sell you things. Well, maybe we can use some of that technology to actually do some good uh, in this sort of way. Uh, and then improve engagement. You know, uh, People are not coming to treatment. They're not doing the things that are good for them. Well, how can we drive that? How can we use, again, the same kind of tools that are being used to get people to keep using apps or selling them things to actually apply it in the mental health uh, sphere? And then there's a few other things which I think time will tell whether we are able to do, you know, better diagnosis or there are ways to use big data and different ways of using sensors, different ways of combining sensors and data um, that is patient provided to drive analytics, to do decision support, that's better, um, you know, time will tell. And then we'll touch on some of these and what, what the problems are uh, along the way. Um, and then we talked about treatment, you know, maybe there ought to be some standardization that can be driven by technology. Uh, maybe part of that is delivered by the technology. Maybe part of that is uh, directed by it. So maybe not delivered, but at least you start to push the idea that, hey, you know, this, this really should uh, make you consider treatment X. It shouldn't be what the person you happen to contact is good at. It should be the thing you actually need for the condition that you're presenting with. Um, and then as you talked about optogenetics and other things, uh, maybe that can be factored in as time goes on. Um, I just wanna do a quick time check. So how much time do we have um, through the rest of the lecture here? About 30 minutes. Okay, great. So that'll give me uh, plenty of time. Um, so the next few slides are just to give you a sense that um, people have been looking at trying to apply technology. This was one review and basically their idea is, you know, anytime and everywhere ubiquitous tech, right? That's what they're looking at um, to add to traditional care. And that's this laundry list here, non-clinical focus on the bottom, clinical focus on the top, tailored to specific diagnoses. So in this survey, you know, there's a fair number, um, uh, 30 plus up here and about 10 plus down here. Um, and the pattern that emerges is that a lot of them focus on sensing, right? That's, that's where the technology is. It's both passive and active sensing. And I just wanna spend a few minutes on um, passive versus active. 
So the main takeaway is that because in a lot of these situations where somebody going through, especially a mental health crisis, may not be the perfect person to actually use an active sensing strategy, it would be great if technology can create ways of doing effective passive sensing. So something that technology is tracking over time, an app kind of tracks X, Y, Z, maybe 10 variables, 100 variables, more, and sets off an alarm. And that says, okay, this, this is, something's going wrong here. And let's try to use predictive analytics so that, um, as you see up here, 30% did predictive modeling, uh, use predictive analytics so that you can use that sensor data that's grabbed passively to then hopefully prevent a bad outcome. That would be really one of the great ways that um, technology can help with the treatment of uh, mental health conditions. And so, but in order to get there, obviously there's a lot of obstacles and we'll kind of talk about where things are in the meantime. But as you can see, we're, we're really at the first step here where we are most of our effort in the field, uh, at least as of this uh, point, uh, pre-2020 is uh, in sensing. Um, this is a, another review that kind of looked at it over a couple of years to see, okay, you know, now we're getting this proliferation of apps in the last few years. This particular one was published, let me see, I think 2019, 2020, uh, 2019. Um, uh, you know, what do we look at? And so they looked at, you know, what kind of platform they looked at, are there any claims being made about, hey, this is gonna treat X, Y, Z condition. Does it cost you anything? What kind of intervention is being used? Um, and then, um, you know, what are the mechanisms? You know, is it is it tracking where you are? Is it asking you questions? Is it looking at what you're doing with your phone? Is it asking you to write notes or is there gamification? As some examples. And so basically um, in this particular comparison where they looked at a group of apps, they looked at 10 Android and 10 iOS by these six categories, so 120 total. Uh, so some, as you can tell, like hypertension are not mental health, uh, uh, the others are. Um, and they basically say, okay, um, so in brackets, it's what happened in 2018, outside brackets, what happened in 2019. So the hope is, well, apps are increasing in number, uh, you know, as of now, there's thousands. Um, so are they getting better if we use these metrics? You know, do users like it? Is there a privacy policy? Not whether it's good or not, it's just, is there one? Do they tell you what's happening? Uh, is there a way for you to get rid of your data uh, if you don't want it to be there? Uh, is it gonna cost you something? Um, and uh, how often is it being updated? Is it telling you something about, is it gonna treat condition X, Y, Z? Um, and is there evidence? So, so they tell you, okay, we're gonna do this, that, and the other thing, but is there actually evidence in some kind of a way or they've studied or somebody has studied to actually provide some support to that? And that, that's probably the worst of this table where you can see it's in, you know, it used to be zero in many instances, uh, went up to tens and twenties, but it's still very low in terms of the percentage of apps that are providing any sort of support to say, we're gonna do X and this is, the reason why you should believe that. So that's a big problem. So it's sort of like, you know, being provided a medication and saying, well, you know, I think this will be good for you. Well, what's the evidence for that? Well, never mind about that. Um, or, you know, one out of five or one out of 10 times that happens, you actually have some basis to say that. So that's where we are in this space. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate, the numbers in terms of what's available, definitely increasing, uh, but it seems like the quality is not. So how do you navigate this? Um, one of the ways um, to navigate this is um, there, thankfully, there are a few sort of categorizing websites uh, that do a bit of reviewing and also a bit of basically feature categorization. And so this gives you uh, an index of that on the left side here. And then these are just some examples, various apps in this column. You know, is it well written? Is it patient facing, et cetera? So, this is done by Mind, hosted on one of the Harvard hospital sites, um, led by a team up there that does digital psychiatry. And so, they have a group of raters that goes through and systematically does 
basically what they describe on their website. You know, this is how we're rating them. So when you go in and you want to look for something, we can tell you what we think of it in this somewhat detailed way. So then you can go fil filter and the hope is that ultimately it'll help you with app selection. Um, these are some examples of what that looks like, right? So accessibility, how much does it cost? Um, does it need to be online? Uh, privacy policy, as you saw, um, you know, what features does it have? Um, how do you get people to engage with the app? And then as we talked about clinical, which is an important category. There's also another site that's called One Mind, which tries to do a similar thing. It's reviewing aspect seems to be less extensive. Um, and so I think in time, hopefully um, it'll be a good complementary resource to the um, uh, first mind site that I uh, pointed to. So now that we see, okay, there are apps and you've seen some characteristics of what those apps are, what are they trying to accomplish? Um, uh, you know, technology in the service of mental health. Um, what is it that they can help with? You know, you've, you've kind of seen that, okay, there are these problems with the apps, but if we look at the, the course of an illness in a person, uh, where can we intervene? So this gives you maybe a, a, a bit of a flavor of that. Um, where should you intervene? So prevention, um, is there a way to give you a risk score? Uh, that could be one way. And especially as genomics comes into the picture and we maybe learn more from neuroscience. So maybe there's ways of behaviorally testing some of that. Um, and so really focusing on wellness uh, and, and measures that are preventive, because in medicine, we tend to do prevention the best when we can succeed at that. Um, early detection, we talked about sensors using um, analytics to serve alerts, maybe also create stress tests. So maybe it's not obvious if you just do passive collection, maybe there's passive is tailored to active where there's a, you know, you play a game and that kind of tests maybe how you react to things. Um, and then again, personalizing that um, in an evidence-based way. We talked about access in terms of being at the right time and the right place, maybe even being agnostic to uh, the current limitations. Uh, we talked about some of these other things like decision support. Uh, and then also gathering data. Uh, you know, is, is the thing you're doing to treat the condition, is it working? Um, uh, most people are not out there putting out data that says, hey, when I do X, Y, Z, um, this is how well it works. And I think that should be something that should be easy to do. So, um, and I think technology could be a great way to get out there. Because um, then uh, from a consumer end, you can be a much more informed consumer when you say, hey, I wanna do this and I wanna do it there because look, their data really speaks um, volumes of what they can do. Uh, and then we talked about downsides like um, alerts for uh, adverse events. So the other side, so those are in the life cycle of anxiety, depression. On the other side, when we talk about um, what should AI be mindful of as we collect all this data, as the number of apps goes through the roof, we need proven interventions. We've talked about that. Um, otherwise, what you're doing um, is kind of like sna selling snake oil. I mean, that's, that's not okay. Um, the consenting process needs to be simple, especially for this population, especially if they're in crisis. Um, and for equity, you know, because you don't know if uh, everyone in there is going to have the resources to kind of work through what needs to be worked through to understand what's the right answer, what, is, what are the problems they might run into by signing on to something like this. Um, which then speaks to transparency and trust, super critical. So extra effort has to be made, especially in this mental health space. Um, the other aspects have to do with more practical things. Um, you know, passive monitoring tends to be more practical for the reasons we talked about. Reduce friction so that people incorporate whatever you're doing into their workflow. Um, and then trying to tailor devices to mental health. You know, right now, phone is a general purpose thing. Uh, maybe it lasts. Um, for, for longer, uh, but potentially maybe there is even a version that, um, that's, that's built better uh, to cater to mental health. Um, and then as we talked about social support, it's super critical. So now I wanna switch a little bit to start to say, okay, you know, um, we talked about apps, individual, you know, sort of in some detail, 
talked about the individual course of illness. Now let's take a step back and sort of say, what are some more um, um, AI ML type strategies that are being used? This is one um, survey um, that I found quite useful and let's look at the landscape. So big picture. And that will also include systems, not just individual patient journeys. Um, so in the application of ML and mental health, so specifically looking at ML as opposed to just technology in general or apps in general, um, as you've seen, the, this is a nice little spike here. This is 2019, and uh, hopefully that continued. Um, the main work was in model development. Um, with, as opposed to, you know, empirical study, um, uh, applying algorithms or design. And um, based on what we're talking about and what we've seen so far, I would argue it's probably a good time to spend a lot more time on design and concept because there seem to be some fundamental issues with how uh, the apps are being designed and fundamental issues with identifying what is the problem they're trying to solve? You know, what is it that they're solving first? Because if that's not clear, then you know, the solution you have is really uh, not gonna be effective. This is another way to slice the data in terms of what people have been up to. Um, this is either collecting data or it's access to existing data and uh, where it's coming from. So a big chunk of it is existing data sets. That's what a lot of the ML work is being done on, health records, some part uh, and some combination. And then uh, as you can tell here, sensors, as we talked about, had a good head start that remains. And then the rest of it is coming from uh, either um, patient uh, provided information or a large part from social media. And then um, the other question is, okay, well, these are the sources and the system setups. Uh, who are the people? Who's actually providing the data? Uh, and as you can see, both categories, whether it's existing data sets um, or data collection, a uh, significant chunk is folks without a mental health diagnosis. So here it's a large one, which is troubling because really if our goal is we want to collect data, make good models, test the models, and then implement, implement them, we should be doing that based on folks with diagnoses that we can try and treat. Uh, that's not the case, at least in the data collection survey here. Um, it was the case more so um, when we're looking at existing data. Yeah, that's good, but that also has some pitfalls, as we'll see. So this is a bit of a busy slide. What it's trying to do is give you more granular information. So what is the kind of data that's been out there? So this is data collection. So people with mental health conditions, small numbers, 10 patients with bipolar, 24 with PTSD, 25 with MDD. And then, you know, you start to look at 500 users on Twitter. Uh, 600 participants, um, uh, students are working professional, uh, almost 2,000 Twitter users who self-report uh, various diagnoses, 4,000 Twitter users who have some other um, clinical characteristic. So this is in the bucket of folks where there is um, some connection to mental health, but it's not a diagnosis that you know. And here um, it's a verified diagnosis. So the folks in the left column, as part of the survey of what's going out there, going on out there in terms of ML studies, uh, tells you that uh, the small studies have some level of verification in terms of mental health, diagnoses, outcomes even. The larger groups are for social media, not been verified, um, and a lot of self-report in terms of what folks have. Um, and so, and, and then on the right side here, you can also see um, participants without a clinical diagnosis, massive data set. So 16, you know, almost 17,000, right, um, participants. Um, and um, no use of clinical screening tools. So these massive sets in terms of, um, the studies being done to build ML models and to test ML models are being done on folks where there is not um, a lot of uh, clinically informed uh, data gathering. And so if we're gonna use this to actually design our apps, it's going to be a problem. This gives you a sense of um, what we call step care. Basically, in order to put some of that um, information that we've been talking about 
uh, in context. So it helps to understand uh, when somebody has some level of uh, an illness, um, who sees them, what do they do, uh, and how does that um, escalation happen? So mild is sort of at the bottom. This is, of course, general scheme. Uh, there are outliers. There are maybe even non-outliers, but different ways of navigating the system. But this is one model um, where uh, you can have this sort of stepwise escalation and stepwise increase in the resource allocated and more specialized streams. So inpatient care is at the top. Outpatient care, primary care, basically, is at the bottom. Um, ongoing care, assessment, prevention. This is a great place for prevention. And then at the top is um, severe life-threatening scenarios, um, uh, severity of illness that is hard to treat. So you have medications, et cetera, and everything in between. So when you start to design apps, I think one of the important things that one has to look at is where is it going to fit in this continuum? What are you targeting? And so far, you know, there really hasn't been much that we can look at and say, oh, this is where this app was designed to help. It's, it hasn't gotten to that point. At least any of the surveys that we've touched on haven't really addressed any of that. So that's obviously an important thing to look at. So this is just summarizing what we talked about. Now, another survey um, that digs a little deeper and says, okay, well, we talked about how social media is really being mined uh, to try to use um, ML for, um, for mental health. So where is it coming from? And so these are two ways of slicing that data. One is that you can see Twitter's on top. We saw lots of studies out there, thousands, tens of thousands of folks who are providing the data uh, that's being scraped from Twitter. Um, and then what is it being studied? What is being used for? Uh, it's been used for depression, probably predominantly, and then uh, suicide next, and then you see the others. So again, the reminder here is that um, where would you even apply data that comes from Twitter, right? Maybe primary care, I don't know. But maybe that person's in a crisis and on Twitter. So unless you ask, unless you have some context for that, um, and unless you're able to understand, okay, what, what is the utility of the data I'm collecting? Uh, whether it's about depression, schizophrenia, something else, suicide, as you saw in there, um, it's, it's hard to know what to do with it. And potentially it's harder to do anything useful with it in the context of an app. Uh, so again, think about this, this sort of framework um, when you're trying to say, hey, I have an app that's gonna help with depression. Well, okay, what kind of depression? Where in the spectrum? Can it maybe cross the spectrum? Does your app have the agility that it can take somebody who's kind of mild right now, uh, or maybe only has a family history, and then maybe it operates at a, at the lower end of this, or maybe it operates at the higher end where it's really for folks who have identified problems. And in, in other parts of medicine, there are concepts of um, you know, primary prevention, secondary prevention, et cetera. And so you know, one can maybe apply that kind of framework. But so far, the apps don't seem to do that. Um, so again, summarizing the problems with um, the efforts out there that are heavily driven from data in social media. That's easy to access, it appears, uh, but seems to have quite a bit of problems in terms of uh, being either valid, uh, in terms of what the objective is, um, lacks a ground truth, because how do you reference it to something you know where a data set has folks with depression? Um, and then um, how about healthy controls? How do you compare that? How do you, how do you know that what you're doing is gonna react differently when somebody doesn't have a mental health diagnosis? So one way potentially to address that is, okay, let's look at medical records. So electronic medical records, EMRs, uh, maybe they're a good source, right? They're collecting data as we speak because whenever you install one of them in a hospital, all your future patients, their information's in there, past information's in there, for different lengths of time. Um, so, so maybe that's gonna help. Well, okay, so in, in some of the natural language processing efforts out there, that seems to be the case. People have focused on medical records um, to say, hey, can we get really good at using NLP to confirm a diagnosis? 
So I can look at the words in what I'm seeing in a note, in a chart, and then I can say, oh yeah, that's the right diagnosis or that's the wrong diagnosis. Hey, maybe we should look at that again. Um, look at the prognosis and say, you know, how well does this person do? Because you have that whole history. So can you take some of that initial data or even decisions and then start to do some predictive uh, modeling? That actually helps clinicians do a better job the next time and prompts them saying, hey, you know, this algorithm says, you know, you're probably going to be wrong 70% of the time if you pick this kind of a choice for somebody with this profile. So that would be amazing. Um, and then there are other aspects, of course, when you're using EMRs, how do you do consent? Because it's somebody else's data, um, especially outside of academic settings. Um, um, how do you create the appropriate training set so that there's the right way to look at uh, populations and, and use them? Um, are your conclusions valid? Uh, how do you test that they're valid? Um, and then how do you deal with false alarms? So maybe you have an alert that, oh, this person's you know, going through some terrible things. But if you're wrong, how do you deal with that? Um, so one example of what might be a problem with electronic medical records, because maybe it seems like a panacea. It's like, oh, great, this is awesome. Uh, we're gonna have all this structured data. It's gonna be written by clinicians. So none of that Twitter stuff. Uh, well, this is an example where you're able to generate an entire note with basically all this text that was generated by the computer, by the system. And the two parts in yellow are the only ones that apparently came from the provider. Uh, physician or other clinical person. So that's a bit of a problem. As people are crunched for time, more and more things get into templates, more and more things maybe are formatted, automated, clicked into place in electronic medical records. So now if you're gonna use all those fancy algorithms with NLP, et cetera, on notes, clinician notes like this, with the idea that, hey, I'm gonna extract something unique. Well, the problem is that uniqueness is not coming from what that physician or other clinical person is seeing uh, when they treat the patient. It's coming from the computer. And it's not entirely clear what that's gonna do. I mean, for one thing, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like that ought to be the source of what individualizes our knowledge of somebody with depression or some other condition. So this is another thing to deal with as we start to look at alternatives to using what has been popular, such as social media. Um, as we talked about, lots of uses, but there is a few problems. Um, then there is another use case where, again, um, AI has been implemented in lots of ways, and that is to have chatbots that um, help you cope better. So this is going to supplement or maybe even completely replace you speaking with your therapist. So these are some examples of conversations between a patient and a chatbot. And this particular one um, will talk to you on the basis of um, what the emotional thread of your conversation is. And it'll give you what they, um, say is evidence-based. So they have in their algorithm something that uses a certain kind of therapy that's tied to how you use emotional words and it's supposed to respond according to those rules. Um, it sounds kind of cool, but does it work? Well, so again, the, the proof, is, proof of the pudding is in the eating. So one of the one example is the randomized control trial. Um, so that's a good way to study a problem like this. Um, in this instance, a non-clinical population, basically college students from a bunch of universities was recruited. Um, each group is about 25-ish people. Um, and they basically measured a, a, a depression scale, uh, which starts off somewhere in the region of seven to eight, and then watched it over time, the blue, um, according to their statistics, gets worse. That's the control group where they give them a website or some resource to get information. And then the other two 
they have access to what they call integrative AI. It's, it's, it's this AI that can kind of work through text or messenger or some format and, and basically uh, be, be kind of this supportive uh, conversational um, chatbot. And the idea is, hey, you know, it, does it help when you have this? In this case, they claim it helps. Um, the PHQ-9, which is a measure of depression, goes down, um, depressive symptoms, um, goes down over time when the chatbot was used. Interestingly, not as much when you go to four weeks than when you go to two. The problem with this scenario is that um, this is not somebody who has depression. So it was not meant to be that way. They didn't ask for people with depression. They asked for volunteers. And they said, hey, we're going to measure your score and we'll see what happens. So really, this may be a model for what needs to be done. But as it stands, this type of study is of limited use because we don't really know what it's going to do in somebody with a clinical diagnosis. But, but this is, we need a lot more of this. We need large studies uh, and we need ways of tracking that, well, sounds cool to have a chatbot, but does it actually work? Does it help? And then again, the question would be, where does that apply? And potentially it applies in step one and two, right? So this starts to give you, you know, where can you intervene? Some automated things, maybe prevention. Okay, so you're not trying to actually treat, so you don't need a study like that, but maybe larger longitudinal studies. Um, and um, so maybe there's relief for some feedback that the patient can report to say, oh yeah, you know, I don't feel stressed as often during the week, for instance. So primary prevention. And then as you go up the spectrum, you're gonna to have to provide more and more proof for an app that does something with somebody who already has depression, who's in between episodes, depression that's hard to treat, et cetera. Having problems with access. Um, so it's just summarizing what we talked about. So hopefully what you've seen so far, um, as we've kind of navigated um, the problem, which starts off with certain kinds of access issues. Um, we didn't talk about really equity in that context. That's definitely a big thing in mental health. Uh, availability of resources as part of the access problem. Um, and then um, in addition to providing uh, the effective solution to the mental health problem at the right time and place, um, it's engaging with the patient um, and giving that person the, the kind of the hook, the motivation to get through what they're dealing with, which often comes in a therapeutic relationship. So those are the aspects you're trying to solve for because the current outcomes are bad and have gotten worse during the pandemic. The number of technological solutions have really skyrocketed. And many of the assessments we've looked at, those solutions don't seem to improve over time in the metrics we're able to look at or other folks have looked at. Um, and so at this point, I think it's important to go back to concept and design, which wasn't getting a lot of traction in one of those surveys that we talked about and start to say, what is it we're solving for? Where should this be in that process of providing mental health services? And um, what are the specific problems? Where, what are the pain points we're trying to solve for? Um, otherwise, maybe against all odds, you even have a great app that does some really useful thing, but if it's not easy for it to fit into the system, then it's not gonna be used. And that's, that's no good. So it'll, it'll be added to the list of things out there, thousands um, that don't make a dent. Um, and so, and then finally, whatever we do, hopefully improves user engagement, like we said. And I think we've certainly seen that in the commercial sector, technology companies have been maybe too good at engaging users to various ends, commercial ends, and perhaps it's time to start to use that um, 
brain power to try to help in mental health uh, and help folks engage in uh, treatments and um, services that can improve their well-being. So thank you for uh, your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Duvari. Uh, are there any questions from the class? So if you have questions, maybe you can uh, enter into the chat room. Uh, I have one or two questions. So first of all, I think the diagnosis process is really challenging, right? A, a lot of things may be subjective. Uh, we talk about the patients may want to hide their symptoms, mm -hmm. right? And the second thing is even like depression. Depression, unlike, uh, suppose my glucose level is high, and uh, you test in the morning, in the afternoon, I think level would tend to be high. But depression, the mood can swing, right? You can, you can say in the morning, I'm okay. In the afternoon, I'm, I'm not so okay. Uh, and also, I, sometimes I can, I can be confused with uh, unhappiness. Unhappiness is, uh, I, I see something, I don't like it. Uh, yeah, it's nature to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. But unhappiness doesn't mean the person is in, in a depression situation. So, Correct. Yeah, well, so when, a mild, when you say mild depression, uh, it's kind of challenging. So let me, let me wrap up with a second question, because the purpose of our, our study mental disorders is because we want to understand the interactions between consciousness and unconsciousness. So once we study some mental disorders, then it's much easier for us to understand what is normal. And mm -hmm. then maybe we can uh, work toward uh, modeling consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for this purpose, uh, I found uh, Desiree's work, uh, mm -hmm. essentially optogenetics can be really helpful because we want to see, oh, when the person has depression, what happened to the neurons, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what are the st stimulus and how this person respond to the neurons? And, and one of his chapter talking about eating disorder, uh, it's kind of scary to me. And at the same time, uh, I think promising there because mm -hmm. it seems like he was saying, okay, when a person has mental dis um, eating, eating disorder, a normal mm -hmm. person, because evolution teaches us we have to eat, otherwise mm -hmm. we will die, right? Evolution means, uh, the purpose of evolution is uh, survival first, mm -hmm. and uh, then we want to, want to just uh, uh, reproduction, so mm -hmm. the it can continue. Yep. So yep. For survival is on nature to say, I don't want to eat, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have urge to eat, and this is starting from unconsciousness, we, we don't, Try to sense whether I'm hungry or not. Right. Because phys physical condition triggers my awareness of being hungry. Mm -hmm. And now there's a second set of neurons. In his book, he said, well, uh, it happens a, a set of neurons get recruited to come in to say, no, you don't want to eat because mm -hmm. if you eat, you are going to get fat and you are going to be right. hungry. Right. And this second set of neurons. Because we, we, we often say, well, this person has two identities in the body. In, mm. a, in the past, I couldn't understand what's going on. He said, oh, this person is evil processed. But when, <laughs> when Desiree was saying, actually, not really, because yourself is somewhere in the brand. But mm -hmm. when this and another cluster of neurons got recruited, mm -hmm. uh, this set of neurons tend to be in your neocortex. Only human being has neocortex, right? Animals right. do not have. Right. So only advanced beings have neocortex. So this is a cluster of neurons ask you not to eat. And this is in a separate cluster of neurons. So, oh, then I kind of agree. I say, okay, one set of neurons is your set yourself. The other set of neurons is another personality. And sometimes the second personality comes out, and sometimes the, the, the yourself is dominating. Yes. So I can kind of picture this kind of what do you mean about evil possessed or <laughs> from this video? No, that I, I, think, I think that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, I think they're just like other mysteries in science or society that, you know, people uh, used either nature or superstition to explain. I think this, this fits, right? So for instance, you could imagine somebody who has an epileptic seizure as being one version of Prozac. You know, it's somebody who shakes violently, has foaming in their mouth. And, you know, I mean, that's sort of like, oh, you know, how do you make sense of this? 
um, and, and you can make a story as to why that person is doing it and maybe there's cause and effect as opposed to a brain uh, disorder. Similarly, uh, somebody who suddenly you know, is presenting a psychotic sudden, suddenly to you, maybe it's quietly been building. Mm -hmm. Similarly with eating disorders, um, you know, in treatment, we'll often refer to, refer to that aspect as the eating disorder voice, right? And, and, and one of the critical aspects in treatment is separation from the eating disorder voice. So is that person able to observe this eating disorder voice, not be one with it, and then influence how they cope and then ultimately overcome it? So it, it, absolutely, if we, are, if we dial the clock back, probably not that long ago, you're you're basically exercising demons. I mean, this is, right, right. there's uh, not a long uh, gap uh, uh, between uh, those concepts. Yeah, that's that's what that's what's promise is if you know where your your class of neurons, your demon are or is, then and uh, using uh, optogenetics, you can turn them off. You can turn the turn the turn the neurons off. That, that's interesting. Anyway, so so. Uh, because of starting consciousness, uh, one relevant topic will be dementia or Alzheimer's diseases or maybe uh, artism, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So for dementia, this is getting worse and worse because we are living longer and longer mm -hmm. and how to keep your neuron uh, healthy and uh, why people lose their memory. And this is one another phenomenon is uh, a lot of a lot of kids will say, "Well, my parent get into dementia, but my parent can can recognize the the caregivers, but they cannot recognize me." All right, mm -hmm. that's kind of very very sad. Mm -hmm. But but if you really know how the neurons work for memory, that could be explained, and that that's actually quite interesting. So so we are trying to study all these <laughs> interesting topics. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think there's a there is basically this. Um, potential uh, to tease apart the layers of memory, because you could think that, you know, maybe, you know, at least in clinical experience, the so-called autobiographical memory sense tends to persist for a long time, uh, even when you're losing short-term memory, so building new memories. And so, yeah, maybe it's possible that we can learn the structure of that to the point where you can sort of see, oh, look, there's this layering of how, uh, you know, maybe not physically, but uh, conceptually, there's this layering of how memories are put into place uh, over autobiographical time mm. uh, as one concept. Or maybe, you know, other people have other structured ways of looking at this as in, uh, you know, there's short-term memories that need to go through this process to become consolidated. And once they're consolidated, they're a little less um perturbable whereas if it's in the short term period then there's a lot you can do to it so there are different constructs of how they've been modeled uh so to your point i think as that can be tweaked more whether it's with optogenetics or other tools uh we might be able to tell um and then similarly um i think for any range of things in psychiatry where essentially you're looking at a break from reality right so psychosis is obviously a clear example uh, eating disorder is another version of that, which is in some ways very curious because that person is not psychotic in the general sense. Uh, they're perfectly fine in terms of being able to tell reality from not in all these different ways, except for this one aspect. Yeah. So how do you do that in the architecture of the brain, right? Um, where you would think if you're breaking from reality, that really needs to be this general phenomenon. But, but in fact, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think as, as you can tease apart um, some of those contract, constructs, it may start to give you maybe a fundamental uh, set of circuits that are kind of our baseline uh, way of keeping the brain functional and aware and all the characteristics that people talk about when they talk about consciousness. Uh, and then maybe uh a lot of the day-to-day -day behaviors and functions we think about are actually overlays mm -hmm. uh they're they're not kind of the essential aspects of consciousness they're they're sort of these not quite extra but additional mm -hmm. uh layers and so maybe psychiatry by kind of 
pulling off some of those functions in these different disorders is able to inform uh, because then that common set of inter the, the intersection set will basically tell you, okay, all of these things have consciousness. So which means that as you delete these various things, whatever you didn't delete and still retain consciousness is actually informing you about what is that, mm -hmm. that intersection um, that maybe helps you define at least some circuits um, and then go from there. Yeah, no, fascinating. Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Devari. And Dr. Devari will come back in nine days to wrap up uh, the part of psychiatry. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, maybe send me your questions. I can aggregate them and forward to Dr. Devari. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I will see you on Thursday next week. All right. Okay, bye-bye.